Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. We are in the last phrase of the Lord's Prayer, the very last part of this wonderful series that uh, we've been in for a number of weeks. And I believe with all of my heart that this prayer contains everything that you and I would ever need to see our nation turn back to God. I believe it contains everything that you and I will ever need to see our own personal lives be restored to a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This final phrase, notice with me if you will, is in verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Notice that there are three very important words contained in this verse. Kingdom, power, and glory. I think these are about as three important words as you will ever hear in the scriptures has everything in the world to do with history. Uh, You'll never understand history until you understand these three words. That little word history itself means his story. Uh, You'll never understand that until these three words uh, become ingrained in who you are. You'll never understand your purpose here in this life until you understand the meaning of kingdom, power, and glory. I've said this numerous times throughout the last probably two to three years. Uh, You are made by God and you are made for God. The reason that you are here today is because God allowed you to be born. He birthed you into existence. You were made by him. You were created by him. You were delivered into this life by God. But the beautiful part is, is that you were made for him. And life will never have any meaning. Life will never have any purpose. Life will never have any significance to you until you come to grips with those things. God made you. You're made by God, and you're made for God. He made you to be a part of his kingdom. He made you to empower you to live in that kingdom. He made you to be a part of that kingdom, empowered you to live in that kingdom for the explicit purpose of bringing glory to himself. Uh, There's where I want to kind of anchor down for just a few minutes in this introduction. Thy kingdom come. Now don't get too wrapped up into the futuristic tense of that little phrase because it really has not only to do with what is ahead for us, it has to do also with a present reality. The kingdom of God is coming, no doubt about that, but The fact of the matter is the kingdom of God is here now. And you say, how is that so? Well, it's wherever God is king. There is his kingdom. If God is king in heaven, then the kingdom of heaven is there. If God is king in your home, then the kingdom of God is there. If God is king on your job, then the kingdom of God is there. If God is king in your education at school, then the kingdom of God is there. If God is king in your marriage, then the kingdom of God is there. It is not only to come, but it also is a present reality. Um, Jesus sent his disciples out on a mission. You can find that in Matthew 10, Luke 10, and Mark 9. And he said to them, uh, I want you to go out there and I want you to be my hands 
and I want you to be my feet. I want you to care for people. I want you to lift up the downtrodden. I want you to share the gospel. I want you to assist the poor. I want you to show my love because, he says, this is a demonstration of the kingdom of God. We hear an awful lot about health care plans uh, in our culture, but Jesus had his own health care plans. He told those disciples, you go there and you heal the sick and you raise uh, the dead. And when you do that, you look them in the eye and you tell them that the kingdom of God is near them, right beside them. It is here now. So the kingdom of God is a present reality. But now notice the second word that is in there. Thine is the kingdom and the power. He is talking about uh, the power that he gives to each of us to live inside that kingdom. It is a powerful resource. You have a present reality. You have a powerful resource. Once you have submitted and surrendered to the will of God in your life, God does not expect you to live for him in your own strength, in your own power, so he takes up residence within you and he empowers you to do what you are physically incapable of doing in your own strength. The word says what is possible or impossible with man is possible with God in Luke 18. You, you understand that once you get plugged into the kingdom of God, it is not you, but it is him in you that is your enablement. The kingdom of God is a present reality. You have a powerful resource to live inside that kingdom and there's a perfect reason for it and it is the glory of God. Um, the word says in Romans chapter 11, he says everything comes from God alone. Everything lives by his power and everything is for his glory. Periodically, somebody comes up to me and we're talking about life itself and they, some of these men will say, you know, pastor, I, I have everything that a man should ever want in this life. I, I, I've been very successful in making a living um, I, I don't want for anything. I don't need anything. I have everything that any man could possibly want, and yet I am so unfulfilled. I am so dissatisfied. Uh, I, there is something missing, he says, uh, in my life. And I'll just look back at him and say, you know what? The reason is because you weren't made for yourself. You were made for God. And the reason that you are so unfulfilled is because God made you to live in his kingdom. He didn't make you to live in your kingdom. And God made you so that he could get glory in your life and you're never going to have the peace that you're looking for until you understand that God made you to live in his kingdom to empower you with his strength and his power so he could get glory in your life. You say, I'd like to have that myself, Pastor. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to be more fulfilled than I am. Uh, I'd like to have more peace. I'd like to have more contentment because, you know, the fact of the matter is I, I got a good house. I got a good car. I got a good income. I really don't need or want much for anything at all, but yet there is just something missing. There's something lacking in my life. I, I like what I am hearing. Well, God says this, I am come that you might have life, but not just existence. I brought myself to you so that you could have an abundant life, more than you could ever imagine. Now, I want you to see something. He said, I'm come that you might have life. He didn't say, I've come to bring you religion. Unfortunately, there are too many people in this life uh, that are satisfied with a religion rather than a relationship. God didn't say, I've come to bring you religion. He says, I've come to bring you life, fulfillment, joy, contentment. 
So many people, they get up on Monday morning and they go through the rituals of getting ready to go to work. They go to work, they work all day, they come home, they grab a bite to eat, they sit and watch a little bit of television, they go to bed, they get up, they go to work, they come home, they eat, they watch a little TV, they go to bed, they sleep. The next morning they get up and they go through it all again. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not life, that's existence. God says, I bring you life. So many people today, and maybe you're one of them, watching through the internet, by television, or maybe you're here today, uh, you're, you're not living because you're living for yourself and you're not living in the kingdom of God empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring glory to Jesus. You say, I want that. How, how do I go about doing that? Well, let me help you with two or three things here if I could. You ready? First of all, it's by the example of living in the kingdom of God. First Thessalonians 2 says, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Literally, what that means is that you get to the place in your life that you turn over a blank sheet and you sign the bottom of it and you hand it to God and you say to God, God, you fill it in. I surrender to you, God. I am submitted to you, Lord. Here is my life. You fill in the script. I will be obedient. I'll do what you say. And I want to care about what you care about. In the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus tells us that there are a lot of things that you don't need to worry about. You don't need to worry about happiness. You don't need to worry about your health. You don't need to worry about your clothes. You don't need to worry about your future. You don't need to worry about relationships. You don't need to worry about your job. You don't need to worry about uh, your family. And then he goes on to say, God will give you everything that you're ever going to need day to day. He didn't say, I'll give it to you weekly or monthly or yearly. He says, I'll meet the needs of your life day after day if, and there's that major consideration, if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Now, let me let you in on a little secret. Are y'all ready for a secret? If you are, shake your head like that. I, I'm, I'm ready for that little secret. Whatever you want God to bless, whatever area of your life you want God to bless you in, put him first in that area. If you want God to bless your marriage, put God first in your marriage. If you want God to bless your career, then put God first in your career. If you want God to bless your finances, then put God first in your finances. And whatever area you put God first in, God is going to bless you. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these other things will be added unto you. You, you, you put God first. So what does that mean? Well, let me give you five areas that I think you ought to put God first in. First of all, I think you ought to put God first in your finances. My wife and I, 51 years ago, the day that we got married, we decided that the first 10% of every dollar that we ever make, we were going to put God first in it. And we were going to trust God in it. And ladies and gentlemen, I can stand here with uh, all of the authority and conviction in my heart and my life today and tell you that for 51 years, my wife and I have kept that covenant with God. And I am convinced that one of the reasons that God has blessed us so immensely is because we put God first. Now, I want to tell you, it wasn't easy. We uh, moved away from home 1,500 miles 
Uh, I was making, um, I don't know, $112 a month, something like that, $150 a month, and then it went up. And, and, and the way we made it, man, we, we would just take our change every day and we'd put it in a can. And those, that last week of the month, we lived out of that can. But we decided long before that, that before we paid anything else or anyone else, anything that we owed them, that God was going to get what we owed him. We owed God a whole lot more than what we owed anybody else and we were going to make sure that that was made. And God has blessed that in immeasurably. Then um, I, secondly, I believe you ought to put God first in your interests. Um, you, you know, your career, your recreation, your hobbies, uh, w whatever uh, you can think about in that area of interest, whatever you're interested in, um, you, you have to ask the question, what does God want me to do here? And seek him. And then uh, I believe that you ought to put God first in your relationships. Uh, I tell you, boy, if there's, ever, uh, if there's ever a message that I believe modern Christianity needs today, it's uh, in this area right here because... So many people today don't have God first in their relationships and they feel like that somebody else can meet the needs of their life and so they put that for Your boyfriend can't meet the needs of your life. Your spouse can't meet the needs of your life. Uh, your friends can't meet those needs. The people that you work with can't meet those needs. Only God can meet the needs of your life. And then uh, I think that uh, God needs to have first place in our schedule. When we wake up in the morning, I believe we ought to give God the first part of every day of our life. We need to begin our day and maybe just sit up on the edge of the bed and say, you know what, God, uh, today is going to be filled with all kinds of opportunities. And so, God, I, 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 wanna, I want you to know that I don't want to make any decision today. Uh, I don't want to schedule anything today that is contrary to your purpose and your will for my life. So you give God consideration in every decision. You just get to the place where you say, you know, if I don't get anything else done today, uh, I want to come to the end of this day having known you more fully and know you better than I did when I started out my morning. And then God ought to be, this may surprise some of you a little bit here, God ought to... Um, have first place in our troubles. We sang a little while ago about the testings and trials and the difficulties of life. My life is in your hands. This is something that has been so mind-boggling to me as a leader and as a pastor when when, when people say, you know, Pastor, I've done everything that I know to do and I have exhausted all human effort and, and, and I've gone to the furthest extents that I can go and I guess now, Lord, that Pastor, that the only thing that's left is that I guess we just have to pray. Well, why do we do that? Why is the Lord our last resort instead of our first response. God ought to be first in our troubles. So I am to be a living example of the kingdom of God. Second, uh, we need to be living with the expectation of the power of God. First Corinthians chapter four, the Bible says, for the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk, it is living by God's power. And I, I see the frustration in so many Christian people because they are trying to live the kingdom life but with human strength. Uh, they, they're trying to bring glory to God from a human perspective rather than allowing the power of God to flow through them. Can I make a statement here that I think is very, very bold but I know that it's accurate. God is not going to bless people who are relying on their own power. God's not going to bless people who are living out of their own 
strength, but to those people who have submitted their lives to Christ, who have surrendered their hearts to the Lord Jesus, who have opened themselves up so that the power of God could flow through their life and have become God-dependent. Are you God-dependent? Do you trust him? Do you rely on him? Or are you relying on your own abilities and in your own strength? The Bible says, listen to this, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Powerful words. Let me ask you a question this morning, all of you. What are you expecting God to do in your life right now? If I were to, individually, if I were to interview each of you and you were to, what are you expecting from God to do in your life today? What kind of answer uh, would you give? You know, I, I can really tell uh, what God is doing in your life simply by what you are expecting him to do. Do you know that uh, every miracle, go study it in the word of God. Every miracle that God has ever done, it has always been in response to what somebody was expecting him to do. What are you expecting God for? Um, do, do you know, um, every Sunday I battle this. I, 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 <laughs> these are not just words, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to understand something. This is the miracle of preaching. This is the miracle of being a pastor. It's a miracle of being a servant of God. Do you know why God has used me the way that he has used me in my life? I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box. I'm not the greatest leader. Um, I, I have a lot, I'm kind of an ordinary kind of guy. Um, I could just tell you without a doubt, unequivocally, the reason God's used me the way that he has in my walk with him is because of his power flowing through my life. And may I say to everybody, that power doesn't come in the green room. I sit right there every Sunday morning going through a huge battle in my mind and thinking, you're not worthy to get behind that pulpit. You're not worthy to preach the gospel. Who do you think that you are to go up there and try to explain the word of God? And I go through that mental gymnastic every Sunday morning. The power doesn't come on that front seat. I've stood before literally tens of thousands of people at one time and typically every Sunday morning we have the potential of being in about two million people's televisions. I'm aware of that every week. Um, why do you think God is used? I want to tell you, there's something miraculous happens when I step up on this platform. Oftentimes back in the earlier days with major migraine headaches, suffered through them for many years, but as soon as my foot would hit the platform, Boom, God just takes over. Amen. It's one of the most amazing experiences that I've ever encountered uh, in my life. You gotta live by his power. The more you depend on him instead of yourself, the more God's gonna bless you. Amen. If you depend on God a little bit, God's going to bless you a little bit. If you depend on God a lot, God's going to bless you a lot. Dependent, living in the kingdom of God, waiting on the resourceful power of God to live through you. Ephesians 3 says, by his mighty power at work within us, he is able to accomplish infinitely more than we could ever dare to ask or hope. Hey, can I, can I say a word to maybe some of you senior adults that are here? May I say a word 
to, to some of you who feel like that you are too sinful, that your past is too sordid, that you don't believe, let me just tell you something. God can do more for you in a week than you can do for you in a lifetime. Some of you senior adults are here and you're thinking, well, you know, I've wasted so much of my life and I've got 60, 70, 80 years behind me. I, I just, you know, I don't think. Let me just say, God can do more in a week with you than you have in the last 80 years of your life or 70 years of your life. If you will surrender to him in your life. You, you say, how, do, how is that going to happen? Let me, let me give you two or three ways. You ready? First of all, by praying. By calling out to God. That is the connection point between you and God. When you have much prayer, you're going to have much prayer power. If you have little prayer, there's going to be little power. James says this, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish a whole lot of stuff through praying. If there's not much going on in your life, there's not much happening in your life. If you feel like uh, that you are so weak and powerless, check up on your prayer life. How much time do you spend calling out to God? Let, let me give you number two, is pursue a life of obedience. When you have called out on God and you're praying and you're seeking his face, uh, the second thing is, is to pursue obeying what God tells you to do even when it doesn't make much sense. You know, God will tell you some stuff sometimes. It just doesn't make much sense at all. You know what he told Isaiah one time? He said, Isaiah, I want you to strip off all your clothes and I want you to preach naked for the next three years. That didn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Boy, did God use that experience in unbelievable ways to come against the enemies of the nation of Israel. So God tells you to do something in the midst of your prayer life, then take the risk. Obey what God tells you to do. The power is going to follow that, and you're going to see God do miraculous things in and through your life. But the issue is you have to make the first move power of God would never come to me if I just sat in that seat right over there thinking how unworthy and undeserving and unqualified that I am. The power of God would never fall until I put my foot up on that platform and say, God, I'm here and I'm going to obey you. When you get to the edge of the promised land, the nation of Israel, it's going to be flood water stage. Impossible for you to cross over to get into the promised land. But here's what I want you to do, Israel. I, I want you to put the leadership out in front. And just as soon as the leadership's foot hits that water, then the waters will part. Now the nation of Israel said, well, wait a minute. Hey, why don't you do it like you did at the Red Sea? Why don't you just open it up and then let us walk? No, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to step down into that water, that raging, overflowing, flood-staged River Jordan. Put your foot in the water. They had to take, you, you know what? They could have stood on the banks till Jesus came and that water would have never divided. But the moment that they obeyed, Back up. He rolled the waters up. I read it again this week. And they walked on dry ground. The leaders stood on dry ground. The miracle happened. In spite of your fears, ladies and gentlemen, obey. Move ahead. God will bless you when you live in the expectancy of his power coming into your life. Let me ask you this question. What do you know 
that God wants you to do in your life that you haven't done yet because you've been timid or because you've been afraid, because you've been reluctant, because you have procrastinated? What is it that you could put your finger on right now and name it that God wants you? Well, what are you scared to death of doing? Maybe it's to open your heart up and ask God to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart and to save your soul. Maybe it's to join the church. Maybe it's to be baptized. Maybe it's to teach that Sunday school class or whatever it is or that small group. Maybe it's to step into some kind of leadership role. But you already know what God has wanted you to do, but you, because of this, that, or the other, have not done it because you've been scared. God wants to show you his power. Third is persistence. Not only pray and pursue obedience, uh, be persistent, stick with it. Don't give up, even though the tests and trials and discouragements may come at you, even though you may hit some dead ends from time to time. Don't give up, don't quit. Keep on keeping going because God may be sending you a message that I'm testing you. I'm putting you through this so that I can show you my glory and my faithfulness. Let me give you the third and the last. It is by living in the exchange of my glory for his glory. By living in the expectation of the power of God in his kingdom. And third, by living in exchange of my glory for his glory. Listen to this scripture, Romans 6. Jesus died to defeat sin, and now he lives for the glory of God. So you should consider yourselves dead to sin and able to live for the glory of God through Christ Jesus. So whose glory are you living for? I grew up living for the glory of my parents. I wanted to prove to them that I was worthy. Whose glory are you? Are, are you living for the glory of your parents? Living your life based on what you think that they want you to do in your life? Are you living for the glory of your boss? Are you living for the glory of some boyfriend? Are you living for the glory of yourself? God did not put you here in this life to fulfill the desires of some other human being. He put you here in this life to fulfill the desires that he has for your life so that he could receive the glory for what he does through you. How do you do that? Let me give you three or four quick things. You ready? Number one, you got to love other people. Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Now I'm not talking about approving what people do. I, 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 I know that. I'm not advocating that with you. But I'm talking about accepting people for who they are and to love them for who they are, not for what they do. Amen. And most of the time, we look at somebody and we base whether or not we're going to love them and accept them if they're living some lifestyle that we approve of. Right. But you gotta love people. Use your abilities to serve other people. God didn't give you the talents in your life just for you. The uh, Bible says God has given each of you some special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other so that he will be glorified. That's when God is glorified. He wired you up to be a contributor. He didn't wire you up to be a consumer. Some of the greatest friends that I have in my life are so gifted in areas where I'm not. I couldn't work on a car to save your life. I so admire 
people that are able to work with their hands and fix an automobile. I so admire somebody that can pick up a hammer and drive a straight nail into a board and make whatever it is that they are fashioning look something like it ought to be. I, I've never been able to do that kind of stuff. So I like surrounding myself with people who are strong in areas where I am weak so that God can take the gifts and the abilities, the talents and the strengths that he has given to me to enable them to be better and for them to enable me to be better. Can you love somebody? Can you serve somebody? Then third, witness the good news with everybody that you come into contact with. You're going to live in the kingdom of God to be empowered by the power of God for the glory of God. You've got to tell people about Jesus. You've got to witness the gospel. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, as God for Christ's sake brings more and more people to Christ, God will receive more and more glory. I'm not bringing people to a church. I'm not bringing people to a religion. It's one person bringing another person to another person. To the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know that every time that you share your faith, every time you tell your story, God is glorified. Every time somebody walks down the aisle of a church that you've been praying for, that you've been sharing your faith with, God gets glory. Every time that you bring somebody to the house of God to hear the message of God, God gets glory. That's so important that we identify who our one is and we develop that relationship with them that we tell our story to them that we invite them to church to hear the gospel it is for the glory of God it's not for baptismal numbers sake it's so Jesus could be glorified and then be a part of a local body of believers some of you need to join the church the Bible tells us to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time forever and ever amen do you know that the only thing that is going to last in eternity is the family of God and the word of God? Heaven and earth is going to pass away. And the only thing that's going to last in eternity is the family of God and the word of God. Why wouldn't you want to be a part of something that's going to be forever? I do. You ought to join the church because it's the only thing that's going to last going to outlast your career. It's going to outlast your hobbies and everything else that you do. We're making an eternal difference and I want to be a part of something that is making an eternal difference for the glory of God. So you need to join the church. Well, what's going to bring God glory? It's loving others. It's serving other people. It's telling people about Jesus. It's making sure that you are plugged into something that is going to endure, that's going to last, that local body of believers that is making an eternal difference in other people's lives. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.